Hi, I'm Brian Leversee, pastor at Fellowship Baptist Church here in Vienna, West Virginia. And we would invite you to come home with us at Fellowship every Sunday on WTAP NBC and WIYE CBS. We know that you'll love worshiping together with us. We look forward to worshiping with you.
have awoken the master. Oh, he knows your voice. So lift your hands, it's time to rejoice. Child, your cries have awoken the We're so glad that you joined us for coming home with Fellowship Baptist Church. We hope that you'll join us one day in person. We have a wonderful atmosphere for worship, wonderful thriving children's programs for your young people, and then adult Bible classes for really every stage of life. So come and check us out in person. We'd love to have you. And if you're enjoying this broadcast, please go to our website at takemehome.church and click on the Give button. We'd appreciate you partnering with us in this ministry so that we can keep connecting you with the wonderful truth of God's word. God bless you. Notice what John says here in verse number two. By this we know that we love not just God, but the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. Now remember with me just for a moment the, the Ten Commandments. You know the biggies. The one, when we think of commandments, we think of Charlton Heston, you know, holding up those, those rocks. And throwing them down on the ground. That's what we think of. We think of Moses. We think of the Ten Commandments. That's the commandments, right? Well, actually, there's a lot more commandments in Scripture than just the Ten Commandments. But consider with me just the Ten Commandments for a, more, for a, for a moment this morning. We understand in the Ten Commandments that there were some commandments that were Godward and that there were some commandments that were manward. There were some dictates on how we should behave concerning God, and there were dictates about how we should behave concerning one another. That's the spectrum of the commandments. And that's brought to bear in a synopsis of the commandments in the New Testament. Remember what Jesus said about the commandments, specifically the Ten Commandments and even the Law and the Prophets. He said this, all of it's wrapped up in this thought, all of it's wrapped up in this principle, all of it's wrapped up in this idea. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. That's God word. And then love your neighbor as yourself. That's man word. And encapsulated in all of that is all of the law and the prophets, Jesus said. So now we get a depth of how rich this understanding of, of these commandments are. Yes, they, they give a representation of our love for God, but they also give a representation of our love for each other. What is John saying here? He's saying we love others best when we love God first. Love God with all your heart and then love others as you would love yourself. So commandments are important. Commandments are the test of love. Just for a moment, if you're a parent in the room, think about how you feel when your children disregard what you have to say. Come here. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Can you feel the love? No, it's hurtful. It's distressing. And we often enter into diatribes about, I pay for everything you have. How can you treat me that way? How can you not love me? I put a roof over your head. I give you a room to sleep in. I provide for your education. I take you to the doctor and, the, and you are going to stick your tongue out of me. Think about how you feel. And now I want you to think about the wounding that it puts on the one who gave his very life for you and me. He didn't just buy a house for us. He didn't just provide our food and our sustenance, though he does provide those things for us, I want to remind us. But he's actually given his very life for you and me. And for us to sit there and go to him, it's a sign of where our love is at for our Savior. So these commandments are important. They don't save us. I want to be clear about that. Following the commandments cannot save us. The Bible's replete with scripture that talk about how the law is merely a schoolmaster that shows us that we fail spiritually and it brings us to a knowledge of our sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. But commandments do say something about our real relationship with Jesus. Our, command, our following of commandments say something about our love for him. And by the way, our love for others. I, listen, I believe this wholeheartedly. I can't be the dad that I need to be to my kids if I'm not following God's commands for my life. I can't be the husband that I'm called to be to my wife if I'm not following the commandments of God for my life. 
I can't be the pastor that I'm called to be for this church if I'm not following the commandments that God has for me in my life. And by following his commandments, I'm loving you and I'm loving my wife and I'm loving my children. Why? Because I love them best when I love him first. Commandments are important and they are a barometer of your spiritual condition. And another thing that we need to understand about these commandments is not just the familial aspect of being in his family and how we treat each other and how we behave towards God, but it also brings in this aspect of how we feel about what he says. Notice it says here in verse number five, I'm sorry, go back up with me to verse number three. It says his commandments at the end are not grievous. What does that mean? It means they're not heavy. They're, they're not burdensome. Let me explain to you what Jesus did. When he gave his life for you and paid the price for your sin and you received that as a free gift, by the way, from him, this is what he did for you. He broke the chains of sin. He broke the chains of bondage in your life. He freed you from what was burdensome. He freed you from that guilt and that shame. And by the way, how many of you are glad that if you're saved, you no longer have to bear the weight of your sin? He bore that. Are you all awake this morning? Somebody say amen real quick. Let me just know. Is there other pulses out there this morning? All right, amen. Listen, he freed you. Somebody say amen, he freed me this morning. Turn to somebody next to you and say he freed me this morning. If you're saved, turn to somebody. Amen. All right, participate a little bit here this morning. How many of you know it's okay to get excited in church when truth's being preached? How many of you know the most important truth that can be preached is that we're freed from our sins? That's right. Because of our Savior, because of who we know Jesus is, okay? <laughs> you go home today, I can see the conversation. We got rowdy in church this morning. Was that okay? <laughs> We got a little excited. That was, is that what I mean? Well, I'm excited this morning. I'm excited that we're freed from our sins. That's what Jesus did. When he saved us, he freed us from our sins. Now, don't feel like this about God. Oh, and now I have to obey him? You mean he's got commandments for me? No, 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 it's different. Over here, the sin that we thought would bring pleasure only brought pleasure for a season, the Bible says. And then it entrapped us and it ensnared us, and it brought guilt, and it brought shame. But with God's commands come life, because God doesn't give us grievous commandments. They don't burden us. They don't overladen us. His commandments free us to live the life that he designed for us to live. Like, I remember as a kid growing up and not liking when my parents said, don't do this or do this. I thought they're just trying to steal my joy. Why are they telling me no all the time? I know why they're mean. How many of you have ever thought that about your parents before? I mean, active, real live examples in the room tonight. They're mean. That's why they tell me no. No, no, no. I realize now that I'm older that it probably was not a good idea to run around in traffic. I learned it probably wasn't a good idea to jump on my bed holding a sharp kitchen knife. These are things that I should be told, no, don't do these things. And God's commandments as our heavenly father are very similar. He doesn't give us commandments to steal our joy. He gives us commandments to be in his will. He gives us commandments to preserve our life. He gives us commandments to be at peace with him. He gives us commandments to show us what he desires from us. How many of you are glad that we have a God that loves us enough to give us the truth about what we need? We don't always like to hear it because we want to battle it in our flesh, but we need to hear the truth and God gives us the truth because he loves us. So don't recoil from his commandments and don't have a bad attitude about his commandments. Understand that his commandments are there on purpose because he loves us and he wants the best for us. Right. I'm gonna be glad he is a wonderful heavenly father to us. Amen. He loves us. We see here this morning, that if we're gonna have a faith that wins, it needs to be a faith that believes the right thing about Jesus. It needs to be a faith that obeys Jesus. And lastly this morning, a faith that wins is a faith that has victory in Jesus. A faith that has victory in Jesus. Notice with me verse number four of 1 John 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So you've trusted in Christ, good. You're born again, good. Now guess what? You're not a loser, you're a victor. You're an overcomer. But wait, pastor, I'm experiencing these difficult things in my life. I kind of feel like a loser. I kind of feel beat up on. I kind of feel distressed. I kind of feel broken. 
kind of feel left sometimes. I kind of feel like I'm on my own. How about you know there are Bible characters that felt those ways? Many of the Psalms that David wrote, really as he, as he just kind of poured out his heart to God, man, I'm surrounded, I'm defeated, I'm in a cave. What's going on? Elijah in a cave. Nobody's left but me. And many times you find where people come to this point where they feel like they're defeated. And John is reminding this church that thinks they're defeated by their flesh, think there's no point to battle against sin, think they're just waiting for the spiritual world where they can really live a life that matters and sin just confirms the grace of God here on earth. He's saying, no, you have victory over sin and you have victory over sin real time if you will follow the spirit and you won't obey the lust of the flesh. He's saying you have victory, you can overcome. Notice verse number five, who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. So you're born into the family of God, you believe that Jesus is the son of God, you believe that his spirit lives in you and you have overcome the world. I wanted to just end this morning by illustrating some ways that we are overcomers in Christ. How, how have we overcome? How are we victors? How do we win? How, how do we experience winning right now? Because this is the way a lot, of, a lot of Christians think. Oh, we'll win when Jesus comes. By the way, how many of you are looking forward to the coming of Christ? Amen. But don't have this attitude. Oh man, it's all over. Hey, everything's just going downhill from here on out. I'm just gonna hide in my bunker and wait for Jesus to come. Now, I want you to know you can have victory right now. So where does our victory lie right now? How do we see the fruit of victory right now in our lives? Well, first of all, if we believe the right thing about Jesus, it challenges godless philosophies and erroneous religions. By us as believers standing for the truth, by us saying, no, there is a Jesus. He was real. He's the son of God. He's God in the flesh. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose the third day. If you'll believe in him, you will be saved. And we stand on that truth. We confront the lies of the world. And we are overcomers because how many of you know the truth always wins? The truth will make you free and you will be free indeed. It may, hey, I bet it looked to Paul or to other people. It didn't look like this to Paul. But to other people, while Paul was locked up in a prison cell awaiting to be beheaded, it looked like... Uh, there was defeat there. I bet for John the Baptist, who was also beheaded, it looked like there was defeat there. I bet for all of the apostles, all of them were martyred, killed for their faith, except for John, the one who's writing this, and they tried to kill him, but he just wouldn't die. <laughs> I kind of want to be like that. You, you can try! But, but all these guys probably look to the world like losers, Spent most of your time in prison. Some of them, John, you know, tradition says he was boiled in oil and then exiled to Isle of Patmos. Nobody wanted him around. These early preachers would go into cities and people would throw rocks at him and throw him into prisons. And yeah, these guys are real winners. And we look at that and we think, well, hey, how many of you think that on the cross is our savior was battered and broken and bruised and naked for our sins? How many of you think to those Romans that were mocking him, he looked like a big loser? But how many of you are glad that third day he rose again? Amen. And if we know him, we're risen in him. And when we stand in his truth, we confront the godless philosophies and the erroneous religions of this world. And we say there is a one true God and he made himself known in his son. And you can know him and you can have a relationship with him. How else are we overcomers in this world? Well, if we obey God. So if we believe the right thing about God, but also if we obey God, it demonstrates God's presence, power, and purpose here in this world. As we obey what he tells us, the presence of God is felt among those that are in this world. Now, one day when Jesus comes for his church, we're going to be raptured out. He that letteth will let. The Holy Spirit will be gone. There won't be that influence of his presence in the same way here anymore. But how many of you are glad in this church age, his spirit is in us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so as we obey Jesus, people see Jesus in us and we're overcomers. People should be able to see that Jesus is real in your life. John's writing, I saw Jesus. I know he's real. 
And he's saying, if you will love like Jesus loved, if you will be the hands and feet of Jesus here on earth, people will see Jesus in you. And you're an overcomer. Why? Because we are exhibiting the presence and the power and the purpose of Jesus. How many of you know that's what people need to see today? People, people today, people today, I'm telling you, they don't know where they came from. They don't know who they are and they don't know where they're going. They have no purpose outside of fleshly, temporary gratification. They have no knowledge of God, the creator and what he did to save them. They're caught up in the secular humanism of our world where they are their own God. And the suicide rates have never been higher. The confusion has never been more rampant. The distress has never been more visible. This is a hurting world. And how are we overcomers? By obeying Jesus and being his presence and power and purpose here on earth. It's how we have victory in him. How else are we overcomers? How else are we victors? How else do we overcome the world here on earth? Well, by embracing his promises to us, it transcends a worldly kingdom and promises a heavenly kingdom. While everybody else, hey, and listen to me, everybody else who doesn't know God has their eyes fixed on this world, but us who know God should have our eyes fixed on heaven. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I may be an ambassador here on earth, but like Paul said, my citizenship is in heaven. Amen. So regardless of what happens here on earth, how many of you are glad we can transcend that in the promises of God and we can still have joy? Amen. Oh, come on, act like you're joyful this morning. <laughs> Smile at me. How many are glad we can have joy in the Lord this morning? Amen. Praise God for that. That comes because we transcend what's going on here on earth, not because we've meditated or we've come into harmony with the nature. It's because we know the creator of all things. And we know he's coming for us again. We know he's got a plan for our lives. And we transcend this mess. We rise above it, not because we're great, because he's great. Because he has a plan and purpose beyond this world for us that we in faith grab onto and in faith, there is victory. Amen. I love that song. Don't you like that old hymn, Faith is the Victory? So I'm glad we still sing these old hymns in church where we go here to church. I'm glad for the rich depth of doctrine and Bible that encompasses a lot of these songs that we sing. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. That's how we overcome and that real faith that we have in our great God that transcends everything else that's going on in this dark and broken world. So where do you stand? Where do you stand in believing Jesus? Do you believe he is the Christ? Or do you just know about him? Just kind of have a surface understanding. There's a God, there's a Jesus. I've always believed it. I'm fine. You're not fine. You got to make him personal. You gotta believe he's the savior. You gotta trust in him to wash your sins away and to fill your life with his spirit. Are you obeying him? Do you value his commandments? Do you value his will? Are you following his word and his way? Are you having victory? Are you constantly in distress and discouragement and disappointed? Be transcended to where he is Understand that's where your home is. And we've got great and wonderful promises to grab onto. Let's all stand this morning with our heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around this morning. Maybe this morning you haven't been believing the right thing about Jesus. It's not enough to just know he exists. You got to know who he is. Do you know him personally? Are you counting on your religion? Are you counting on your feelings? Are you counting on your good works to save you? They won't save you. Only Jesus can save you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around this morning. I won't come back to you. I won't embarrass you. I won't name your name. But this morning, if you're not sure you're saved, I'd like to pray for you.
I'd like to pray that God would continue to work on your heart. Maybe this morning you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I don't know for sure if I died today that I'd be with God in heaven. Would you raise your hand? Again, I won't come back to you. I won't embarrass you in any way. I just want to pray for you. I see that hand. You may put it down. Anybody else this morning? I'm just not sure that I'm saved. I see that hand. You may put it down. Anybody else this morning? I'm just not sure that I'm saved. I don't know for sure if I died today that I'd be with God in heaven. I don't have that peace. I see that hand. You may put it down. I believe the Holy Spirit is working this morning. Anybody else? I just want to pray for you. Not sure that you're saved. You've been trusting in your own works, your own your own feelings, your own general knowledge of God, but you've not made it personal this morning. Anybody else like that? Not sure that I'm saved. Listen, I'm gonna pray. My prayer can't save you this morning. But the Bible does say, whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you believe that you're a sinner today, but you believe that Jesus loved you and that he came as God from heaven to earth to die in your place for your sin and that he rose again to give you eternal life, the Bible says, whosoever shall call, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As I pray, you're welcome to pray with me if you raised your hand this morning. Again, I don't have magic words that save you, but your belief and confession in Christ will save you this morning. So as I pray, if you'd pray in your heart, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for loving me. And as God coming to earth to die for my sins, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again to give me eternal life. I repent of my sin. I turn to you. Give me your life today. Wash me from my sin in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want you to know if you prayed that from your heart in faith today, that Jesus promises that he saved you. I'm going to be standing in the back as we conclude our services this morning, and I'd love for you to come by and let me know that you prayed that prayer. I'd love to be able to connect with you, and I'd love to be able to allow you to reach out to me to get you other resources that would help you grow in your walk with the Lord. But I'm so glad if you made that decision today. What a wonderful day this is for you.